I thought about doing something a little bit more special for Slammiversary since it is, you know, an anniversary for TNA, and I thought about doing uh, kind of like what I do with WrestleMania and doing some special videos uh, commemorating uh, TNA or whatever, but uh, I didn't really leave myself enough time to really do that. And Last year I did the top ten best pay-per-view events in TNA history, um, which... I can't believe it's already been a year since I did that video. It feels like I did that one like a month ago. Um, and I can't, I, I don't think I allowed myself enough time to really put the amount of work uh, into that type of video and to really get it out there and get it edited together and get it done. So there won't be anything like that for Slammiversary this year. No like top 11 matches or top 11 uh, whatever in TNA history or anything like that. Uh, you know, um, of course, doing a top 11 would just be a ripoff of the Nostalgia Critic anyway, and I don't need to rip off people better than me, so uh, we'll just leave that alone, and I'll just do a straight-up preview of the Slammiversary pay-per-view, which is coming next week, uh, but with the taped report of the next Impact, uh, we pretty much know what the final card is going to be. And like I said earlier, I don't think it's that impressive of a card, and I talked about it before with TNA. To me, the real test of the of whether or not they can handle the four pay-per-view-a-year format. Um, and I know they do the one-night-only pay-per-views in between, but those don't really count. Um, I mean, those are basically like Coliseum video. <laughs> for anybody... I, I just royally dated myself, but for anybody who remembers the old WWF Coliseum videos, it's basically... That's what those pay-per-views are. Um... Uh, you know, and, and I still support the four pay-per-view a year format. I think that's a better idea. I think that's a better way of doing things, and I think it's uh, uh, could you know lead to building bigger matches and bigger stories. Unfortunately, I don't feel like they really did that with Slammiversary. It just feels like kind of an ordinary card because they're constantly kind of blowing their load on impact with constant title matches and. Um, and, and a lot of the things they've done on Impact lately are not that interesting. Although this week's Impact was not bad. I actually really liked, um, especially the, I thought the AJ segment came off really well. But, um, you know, it, it, Impact just hasn't been, like, the exciting show that it should be, you know, building bigger stories and building bigger matches over a longer period of time. Um, and, uh, that, that's what... You know, if they're going to do the four pay-per-view year format, that's what it needs to be. You know, hold off on doing title matches. There haven't been as many world title matches, which I think is good. Um, it, it feels like it's been a while since we've had one. Uh, so that's actually a good move, but they, I don't think they went with the best world title match for their main event. But I'll, I'll get into that uh, when I get into that. And, uh, you know, I said the same things last year about Slammiversary, how I was like, wow, this card looks kind of shitty, and in the end, it actually turned out to be one of my favorite pay-per-views last year, so, yeah, I guess you never know. Um, I, I think when it was all said and done, I think I put it second only to Extreme Rules last year, as far as the pay-per-views that I saw and which ones I really liked, and ranking them, you know, the best ones. I, I said Extreme Rules was the best, and last year's Extreme Rules was fucking amazing. And again, I can't believe it's already been over a year since that show. It's just, time really fucking flies. <laughs> and uh, Slammiversary was my number two. I, I really enjoyed how last year's show turned out. So I don't know, maybe they'll pull another rabbit out of the hat and make it a really awesome show. I don't know. Um, you never can tell sometimes. But uh, I don't think TNA did the best job um, taking advantage of the extra TV time. And that's the benefit of doing less pay-per-views. You have more TV time to really build these stories, build these matches, build up contenders to championships, uh, build up strong feuds, and then do the ultimate payoff at the pay-per-view. Um, and that's why I'm a believer in that format and why I think that is a better format for them. They just haven't executed it all that well. And let's go into the card. Um, at the spoiler, or, or at the impact next week, they're going to reveal a six man tag match. It'll be basically it's the returning baby faces versus the Aces and Eights. I think it's Joe, Magnus, and Hardy versus Briscoe, Bischoff, and Doc. You know, who gives a fuck? That's basically what they did with Lethal Lockdown, only on a much smaller scale, where it's like, oh, all the babyfaces return to take down the Aces and Eights, and sure, the babyfaces are going to win, because the Aces and Eights lose all the goddamn time now. It's basically the Aces and Eights at this point. It's Bully Ray and his goons, and that's basically what it is. Uh, you know, Bully Ray is really the only one in the group that has any kind of, like, built-in momentum or uh, credibility, and that's kind of a shame, but... You know, whatever. It's it's not like the Shield, who the Shield are, are just fucking unstoppable at this point. The way they're presented, and Aces and Eights, it feels like you know if they didn't have Bully Ray, they'd 
be nothing. <laughs> and that's uh, kind of a shame that that's your top heel stable, but whatever. Uh, at least they're better than Legacy. Uh, they're more credible than Legacy. And, and Legacy had better talents than it. It's just that they were treated like shit. And it was like, even the leader, Randy Orton, was treated like shit and made into a buffoon. But that's, you know... Well, you know, Triple H was thrown into the mix for that one, so you know how that always goes when Triple H is <laughs> in the mix. I already did my whole fucking 40-minute Triple H rant video, so I'll stop right there. But, um, yeah, I don't really care about the six-man tag. They're doing uh, Jay Bradley versus Sam Shaw for a Bound for Glory spot. Uh, or Bound for Glory series spot. Okay, I like that they're still doing the Bound for Glory series. Like I said, they need to keep doing that because it's a fucking awesome idea. I will, And, again, I say it. I've been saying it ever since they started doing it. It's the best idea TNA has ever had. The best idea they have ever had from a creative standpoint. They need to keep doing the Bound for Glory series. And this whole idea of doing a mini tournament for one of the gut check guys to earn a place into the Bound for Glory series. Again, I like that idea. And it's a chance to introduce a new face into the series and hopefully showcase a new talent on a big level. The problem is I'm not that impressed with the gut check guys that they brought in. Um, Christian York is all right, but for some reason he lost the first match, so it's like, all right, whatever. Uh, we're getting Sam Shaw, who is about as unimpressive as possibly imaginable, and Jay Bradley, who has a good look, seems okay on the mic, still a little green in the ring, although his gut check match, the one he had uh, that got him the job, his gut check match was by far the best gut check match that they've done. Um... So, um, you know, it, it feels like TNA wants to run with him, so he's obviously going to win this thing. Um, it's just a shame that the gut check talents that they brought in just aren't that interesting or not that good. Um, you know, and, and Jay Bradley is probably the best one of the four, which isn't saying much. Alex Silva, he was, uh, although I've heard that his career might be over. I remember reading it that he got a massive concussion over an OVW, and that might be the end of his career. I don't know. Well, uh, you know, which is, if that's true, I'm sorry to hear that. But uh, so many of these gut check guys they bring in are just so bland and so green and so like, just not ready for prime time that it's no surprise that they kind of disappear from television right after they, they win their contract. But, uh, um, you know, we'll, we'll see um, with Jay Bradley because he's obviously going to win this thing. Um, I'm not expecting much out of this match because, like I said, Sam Shaw's <laughs> He's bland as fuck. Um, if it were up to me, I'd just have Bradley win it in 30 seconds. But, you know, whatever. That's just me. Uh, that's another match that's not that interesting. Um, there's a match between Gail Kim and Taryn Terrell, former Tiffany of ECW, which uh, I read it was, quote, a last knockout standing match. So I, I'm assuming that's the same rules as a last man standing match. I don't really know. Now, I am not going to complain that this match is not the title match. I'm actually fine with that. Because, like I said, on TV, they've kind of blown their load with knockout title matches. We've already had, like, two or three uh, Velvet Sky title defenses. Mickey just won the title two weeks ago. I'm uh, I'm perfectly okay with not rushing another title match to the pay-per-view. It's like, you know, you've already done your... The, we've already gotten the lion's share out of knockout's title matches. Let's actually hold off on this pay-per-view and let's hold off and build up to a bigger one down the road. And in a sense, you know, you got to be thinking, all right, Gail Kim versus Taryn Terrell, this match... This is a grudge match that they built up for a few months now. Um, the winner of this match is probably unofficially made the number one contender of the title. I'm perfectly fine with that. And actually, I'm going to throw some praise towards the WWE for their... Uh, I, I love their pre-show format now with the the kind of ESPN style with the expert analysis and uh, you know having JR and Mick Foley and guys like that at the booth. And at the last one at Extreme Rules, I didn't mention this in my review, they brought in Wade Barrett to do it. And that guy and you know, they do that with him because they shit on the Intercontinental title. They never have anything to do for him. That was the sole purpose for him being there. It's like, well we gotta do something with him. There was no thought to it beyond that. But the value of doing something like that, especially in the WWE where they're they're still doing the once a month pay per view format, it's like, you know, you don't really have to have the title match at every single pay-per-view. What you could do is have the champion, or let, let's say the world champion, let's say Dolph Ziggler, who um, is uh, on the shelf right now for a concussion. Instead of doing the world title match at every single pay-per-view, you could give the world champion a night off and have him be, be a part of the expert analysis um, during the pre-show, mid-show, and, and post-shows. And have him give his two cents about 
potential contenders that he's going to be facing down the road. Instead of just doing world title match on top of world title match on top of world title match, you can space them out better by giving the champion a night off and giving him a role on the show by putting him on that panel. And, uh, you know, analyze potential contenders and give his feelings on who he would like to face and who he doesn't want to face or whatever. And I got that idea from watching uh, UFC on Fox. What was this? This was before Lesnar came back to the WWE, so this is, must have been late to, uh, 2011. Uh, where, and again, I'm not the biggest MMA follower, so uh, if I, for, I forget who the big names were, but Lesnar was going to be facing the winner of this whatever the main event was on the show and he talked about who he was going to face and why he would want to face you know whoever whatever and uh that was interesting to me it's like they gave brock an important role on the show without having a fight and built up a future fight down the road and that's more of that sports logic that i would like to see inserted into professional wrestling but uh so basically, to circle back to the TNA pay-per-view, I don't mind that there's not a knockouts title match on the show. I don't mind that they crammed another title match into here, and I'm, I like the idea of there just being a grudge match, and that's be that being the showcase for the division, and it makes the division look like it actually has depth. All of that said, this match is going to be horrible. <laughs> this is, I mean, Tara Terrell is getting a push. That's wow, really? I uh, okay. Um... I mean, TNA, I mean, I like a lot of the ex-WWE girls that they brought in. Love Mickey James, love Gail Kim, love Tara. I don't have much faith in Taryn Terrell. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, maybe I'm wrong, you know, uh, I, I, but I just, I don't think this match is going to be very good, and Gail Kim has really got her work cut out for her, I think. I, I just predict disaster for this match, but, you know, we shall see. Um... Let's see, what else, what else? Oh, we got Joseph Park versus Devon for the TV title, which, again, I have no reason to care about the TV title. Uh, they've given me no reason to care about it. I, I keep forgetting Devon has it because uh, they never defend it. And, again, I was against the idea of the weekly TV title defenses that they were doing last year because you, I feel like you kind of burn yourself out on that, and it's like, okay, how can you build somebody up to the title if the title's on the line every week? You know what I mean? Um, and I just feel like that's overexposure of the championship, oversaturation, whatever terminology you, you want to use. And I, I've always been a believer of there should be less title matches in general. So that when there is a title match, it's actually mean, whether it's on TV or pay-per-view, they should be spaced out so that when they do happen, it, it actually does feel like a big deal. Now it just feels like, you know, fans are spoiled. <laughs> That's basically my overall point. Fans are fucking spoiled. And we get title matches so frequently that we don't even give a shit. Um, uh, but all of that said... Uh, you know, I, I have no reason to care about the TV title. They've gone to, like, the exact opposite. Where it's like, all right, it was on the line every week. Now it's never on the line, and I keep forget, forgetting that the, the title even exists. Um, I love the Joseph Park character. I like the potential of the split personality with him and Abyss. I like that stuff. I think Joseph Parker is fucking... Uh, Joseph Parker? Joseph Park! There we go. Uh, I, I love that character to death. You know I love that character to death. I think he's fucking hilarious. Um, and you know what? I would just put the title on him at this point. Why the fuck not? He probably won't. It feels like they're probably going to put it on Magnus because they want, they seem like they want to run with Magnus, but, uh, you know, uh, it's just, they never do anything with the TV title to really make me give a shit about it. And, um, it, it should be, you know, it, the proper booking of a mid-card championship Intercontinental title circa, you know, early 90s. Or even late 90s when The Rock had it. And Triple H and The Rock were having their feud for it. Uh, or The Rock-Shamrock feud as well. That should be... It should be viewed as, like, a awesome... You know, they, 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 actually, you know, the mid-card champion should be viewed almost like the number two guy in the company. And even if they don't always... Um, do that. It should be viewed as like a huge prestigious thing to be that champion. Or Rick Rude when he was U.S. champion uh, in WCW. That's another great example. Um, it should be viewed as a huge thing. It's like, wow, this guy is the, the U.S. champion. It shouldn't be viewed as like an unimportant prop or, oh, he's stuck at IC title level or anything like that. It's like, no, IC title level or TV title level or U.S. title level or whatever should be viewed as awesome. That It should be awesome enough in itself in and enough of itself to where, uh, you know, having that title should be important enough to where I'm not sitting there thinking, it's like, wow, this this guy's really, they're wow, they don't really have anything for this guy. He sucks or whatever. But, 
Okay, that's another rant on mid-card championships. I mean, between this, mid-card championships, pay-per-view formats, and my whole thing about wins and losses uh, <laughs> and how you know getting your win back is stupid, uh, I've got a lot of future videos lined up that I can probably do. I'll, I'll probably do my uh, um, getting your win back video sometime next week. I wanted, I was planning on doing it this weekend, but I wanted to, you know, put like a script down and make sure I, I knew what I was talking about. So uh, you, you'll probably be getting that one sometime next week. So uh, yeah, um, and, and you can tell how interesting the Slam Anniversary card is. I'm previewing Slam Anniversary, and I've talked very little about it. Um, let's see, what else we got? Um, do, 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 do. See, I'm, I'm already forgetting. Uh, the tag title match, um, it'll be Austin Aries and Bobby Roode versus Bad Influence, Christopher Daniels and Kazarian, versus James Storm and fucking Gunner versus Chavo Guerrero and Hernandez. Disappointment right off the bat, James Storm's tag team partner. I'm like, oh, it's a mystery partner. I wonder who it would be. A lot of us were thinking it would be Chris Harris as like a one-night AMW reunion, which I was even against that because I'm like, what kind of shape is Chris Harris in now? Because, and I was really high on Chris Harris back in the day, like 03, 04. I was like, wow, this guy's pretty good. And uh, ever since Braden Walker rolled, reared his ugly head, it's like, yeah, I think your career's kind of sort of done, buddy. And it's, it's a shame that his potential was never realized and he kind of fell off the cliff that like he did, but what can you do? Uh, but Gunner, fucking Gunner, we're gonna try and give this guy another push. Haven't we learned that this guy's boring as fuck and he's not worth pushing? Whatever, <laughs> just whatever. I remember when they were doing the segment on Impact, I'm like, you know, I'd rather head Shark Boy. I'm just saying, like, I, I'm even, I'm dead serious. I probably would have rather had Shark Boy. Um, but man, really, I can't believe that that's the best thing you come up with. I was thinking, I was like, all right. You know, whatever. Um, I, I would rather have Chris Harris, quite honestly. At least it's like, yeah, at least AMW reunited for a night, whatever. Um, but, uh, and Chavo Guerrero and Hernandez are the tag champions for some reason. Like, the Mexican stereotype team. And they're not even, it's not even that they're that bad. It's just that, like, really, they're so uninteresting. I'd rather have Daniels and Kazarian as the champs. Or... Uh, Austin Aries and Bobby Roode. What happened to that whole storyline that Austin Aries and Bobby Roode were going to try and win all the titles? What what happened to that whole thing? Um, I don't know. But uh, this match could be fun regardless of the, you know, beatdown that I'm giving it. And it's an elimination match, which should make it even more interesting and probably lend itself to a really long uh, match, if nothing else. Um, it, it should be good. But I'm not overly interested in it, especially since I feel like I've seen this match eight times. Uh, yeah, James Storm and Gunner, because, you know, Gunner makes everything better. Uh, I, I'm going to steal a line. Uh, you know, I talked about ripping off the Nostalgia Critic earlier. Uh, I'm going to steal a line um, from Nostalgia Critic's brother, Rob, uh, when they did their review of Iron Man 3, and I'm not going to give away any major spoilers here or anything. Basically, um... Rob had a line in the video where he said, Guy Pierce is not the answer to anything. And that's, uh, I'm not going to reveal the meaning behind that, but uh, his line was, Guy Pierce is not the answer to anything. And that's kind of my answer to this. Uh, look, Gunner is not the answer to anything. I don't know why he's in this match. I don't know why TNA is so high on this guy to where they keep bringing him back and giving him pushes. Um, but it is what it is. Um, but yeah, I would have either Rude or Aries, Rude and Aries, or Bad Influence win the tag titles, because I think they're the most interesting. Probably Bad Influence, because they're the more legit team, but, uh, hopefully this match is good, and, you know, that's all you can say. Man, uh, going over TNA's history, I mean, they, one thing that really won me over with them were their tag teams, and it's just sad that the tag division is kind of like, hey, bunch of singles guys thrown together to make tag teams that may or may not work, or whatever, but... Yay, that's a thing. Um, then we got the X Division title match, which is an Ultimate X match. It'll be Kenny King versus Suicide versus Chris Saban. And it's been, they revealed on Impact that the X Division champion was going to be allowed to cash in and go for the World Heavyweight title, um, which is good. And uh, once Destination X was done away with, people wondered whether or not that would still be a rule. And it looks like they're going with that, which I'm totally fine with that. And it gives... If nothing else, it gives the world champion an opponent during the summer while the Bound for Glory series is going on. That's uh, So that's a really good idea. Uh, so Chris Saban's going to win this because uh, it feels like they want to give him a big push. And they, they gave him that big highlight package and everything. And uh, I, I guess you can say the same thing for Suicide, but 
you know, uh, I, I, I don't see... He, suicide's a little gimmicky, and I don't see them... Right. And also, he just came back. He's only had one match back. So I wouldn't count on him uh, being the guy that ultimately wins the Ultimate X. He'll probably be the guy that wins the X title after Saban uh, drops it uh, to go after Bully Ray. And, and they do that match. So, um, yeah, this is fun. Hopefully this is the end of the triple threat format because it's an Ultimate X match. And since nobody can be pinned in an Ultimate X match, it's kind of like, all right, um... I mean, because how can somebody get pinned in this match and then move down to the contenders three-way? So, uh, hopefully that's the end of the triple threat. And they already got rid of the X-Cam, which, thank God, uh, that thing was awful. <laughs> I think it took two weeks for them to realize that thing was awful. Um, and that's another idea. Uh, that's another one of TNA's bad ideas. It seems like for every good idea they have, like the Bound for Glory series, they have at least five or six or maybe ten bad ones. But uh, the X-Cam was not a good one. And this X-Division triple threat format is not a good idea. And I, the matches on TV have not been that good. Uh, they've not been great showcases for the X Division. I'm like, you know, you're better off just doing the singles matches. And I, I, again, I, I give you credit for thinking. It's like you're thinking. It's just you're not executing, um, and that's a problem. So hopefully, this is the end of the triple threat format, and hopefully, uh, they've got plans for you know uh, the X Division title shot cash in later with uh, what it in you know, facing the World Heavyweight Champion at some point this summer. So uh, hopefully they have got plan in a direction, and hopefully that all turns out really, really well. Um, then we got AJ Styles versus Kurt Angle, which I have seen 800 million times. It's another one of those matches is like, all right, look, yes, they have really good matches. I understand that. And yes, AJ Styles has a new character and a new direction, and it's really interesting. And he's going to be the guy that faces Bully Ray at Bound for Glory. It really feels like, again, I'm just taking a guess. That's the direction they're going with. Um, I understand all that, but I've seen this match 800 times. I It's just, I don't care. <laughs> and, well, I mean, I don't want to say I don't care. I, I think they'll have another really good match, because that's what they do. But, I, I've seen this, and I'm not overly interested in seeing it again. It's just one of those things, like, okay, yeah. It, I mean, we're not into, like, AJ Styles and Christopher Daniels bad type of ter territory, where it's like, okay, yes, I understand they have good matches, but Jesus fucking Christ, I've seen this. Can we move on to something new? It's not to the point where I'm so frustrated that I want to bam my head into a wall every time they do it, but Angle and Aries is... Or Angle and Styles, it's a match... You know, look, I, I've seen it. You know, I know what to expect out of these two. I've seen it. And I'm not overly interested in seeing it again. So, uh, I, my pick, AJ Styles wins, just to, you know, keep adding to his new direction and his new character, and uh, hopefully that gives him some momentum heading into the Bound for Glory series. I actually have an idea for how Slammiversary should end, and that'll lead me into the main event, uh, Sting versus Bully Ray. I like that the match is no holds barred. That'll make it better. Um, this is actually one of their more gimmick pay-per-views in a while. Uh, TNA is kind of, lately they've kind of steered away from gimmicky pay-per-views, uh, minus lockdown, and even that they cut down on. But uh, this one's kind of gimmicky, <laughs> which uh, you know, not extreme rules level gimmicky, but, but gimmicky. Um, where was I going with this? But uh, anyway, I like that it's a no holds barred match because that'll make it better, if nothing else. It'll be a more exciting match to watch. And, you know, they can use all sorts of bells and whistles and shortcuts to make the match work as well as possible. Um, and I like the stipulation that if Sting loses, he can't go for the world title anymore. I think that make it, makes it feel like there's something a little bit more at stake and it raises the stakes a little bit. I, I think it's really... Yeah, that part of it is interesting. However, Sting is fat. He's out of shape. He looks awful in the ring. Um, and, like, I just don't care. It, it's like, look, I, I hope Ray wins this match. I hope they're smart enough to give Bully Ray the win here. Uh, let him win it. Bully Ray goes over. He ends Sting's time as World Heavyweight Champion for good. And that will be the best way to end this. Um, and hopefully the match isn't too bad. And hopefully it's just watchable. But I'm not expecting much out of Sting. It's just... I've learned to lower my expectations. And for the people that want Sting to go to the WWE and have that match with Undertaker, I'm one of the ones that's like, have you seen Sting lately? I kind of don't want that match anymore. It's like 13 years ago, sure, I'd, I'd have crawled across broken glass to see that match. But now, not not so much. You got one guy who's fat and out of shape, and you got another guy, and where's he? he's out of shape to the point that he wears a shirt when he wrestles, which that's always a bad sign. And... <clears throat> 
The other guy, Undertaker, is made of glass, and, you know, there's a reason why Undertaker only works, like, typically works around Mania season, and typically only works once a year. It's because he's injury prone, and he's old, and he's brittle, and he's made of glass. <laughs> he can only give that great performance once a year, it seems. Um, well, I mean, this year, you know, he did have a good, uh, the six-man was good, even though he's, you know, in a six-man, he's... Relying on other people. But that's basically my point. Undertaker can't give, like, that killer performance week in and week out because it would kill him. <laughs> but I, I really don't want that Undertaker-Sting match anymore, mainly because of the type of shape that Sting's in. Um, so, okay, Bully Ray ruins this match. Hopefully it's not too bad. And my idea to end the show, Aces and Aces are standing tall. You know, Sting's beaten down. AJ Styles comes down, and they do full-on... Uncensored 97. For anybody who saw WCW Uncensored 97, the ending to that show was Crow Sting coming out and beating the ever-living shit out of the NWO. And it was awesome. That was when Crow Sting finally found, like, a direction and we finally knew what side he was on and when he beat the shit out of the NWO, it was fucking awesome. And that was a great ending to the pay-per-view. And that's what I would do here. It's like, alright, have Bully Ray stand tall with the Aces and Eights or whatever. And then AJ Styles comes down and with a hammer or whatever, like he did on Impact this week, and just starts kicking ass and has a stare down with Bully Ray, and that kind of leads into Bound for Glory, where it's AJ Styles versus Bully Ray, and that that's what I would do. But you know, whatever. But in any case, Slam Anniversary does not look that great this year. It doesn't look like that great of a show, especially coming off of Lockdown, which you know was a solid show overall, with a great ending that really gave them a lot of momentum. A lot of the TV since then has been very lackluster, and they just didn't really get the ball rolling on building up to Slammiversary. And especially Lockdown gave them the formula, or gave them the momentum to do that. And they didn't really take advantage of it. So I don't, you know, that's, it is what it is. Hopefully Slammiversary isn't too bad. Um, uh, but it, I'm looking at this card, it doesn't look very promising. And, uh, you know, it is what it is, but what can you do? Uh, that's it for now. I'll have a couple more videos lined up for you next week, but until then, uh, enjoy your Memorial Day weekend. This is going to be fun. I've got a few barbecues planned out, so it'll be great. So, uh, yeah, until then, I'll see you all later, everybody.